Hi, Secular Coalition for Arizona supporters. My name is Tori Roberg, and I am your Director of Government Affairs, which means I am your lobbyist at the Arizona State Capitol. I'm going to be talking with you today about what's been happening at the legislature this year. This video is the first from the Secular Coalition to keep you engaged and informed during the COVID pandemic. Look for more videos to come. We are pre-recording these videos, and so if you're watching as part of a watch party, I will be available to you to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. If you are not watching as part of a watch party, feel free to email me your questions, and my email address will be at the end of the video. This is um, very interesting for me because normally I present to a room full of people, and today I'm presenting to my empty bedroom. I hope I do a good job for you, and let's get started. <laughs> The Secular Coalition for Arizona is a 501c3 organization organized in 2010 by a group of people who were fed up with religious ideologies being pushed into public policy at the Arizona State Capitol. They, as volunteers, started building relationships at the State Capitol and learning the legislative process. And within a few years, the group had grown so much in membership and in fundraising and donations, they decided it was time to professionalize and hire an executive director. Then in 2014, they hired a professional lobbyist to help them grow their, their mission and their influence at the Capitol. That lobbyist is me. I have been doing this now since 2014, which means I've had seven sessions. I have had the privilege of representing the secular community at the state capitol and otherwise, and it has truly been a, a passion for me. It is totally a privilege. This work brings me great joy and a lot of frustration, as you can imagine, but ultimately, I love this. We do so much more than direct lobbying. We organize constituents to be a part of the legislative process, which is part of why we're doing this video today. Because when you are informed and engaged, you can help transform public policy in this state. Secularism is the best way to ensure a government for all. The bottom line is that for the last 10 years, 10 years, the Secular Coalition has been representing atheists, non-theists, religious people, anybody who believes in the separation of church and state. We've been doing this at the state capitol and we've been very successful. We've been doing it through intensive legislative work during session, including being at the Capitol Monday through Thursday. I am there all day, every day, Monday through Thursday, representing the Secular Coalition. I have private meetings with lawmakers. I testify publicly in committee. I encourage all of you to sign in on the Request to Speak system. Hopefully you've had that. We create action alerts for you when it's time for you to take action. This is what we do. Our name also gives you a hint that we're not just a few people sitting in a room thinking about this stuff. We're actually a statewide coalition with thousands of members. Let me introduce you to our coalition. Our liaison organizations listed here, they help determine the policies we work on throughout the state. We encourage everyone to join one of our liaison organizations. You will meet new friends, you will have fun, and you will probably learn something along the way. I'd like to also introduce you to the board and staff. Secular AZ is driven by a dynamic volunteer board of directors, including four attorneys who compromise our legal team. We are led by our chairman, Zenaido Quintana, one of the original founders of Secular AZ, and we have just three staff who are all part-time. We're up against giants in the evangelicals, um, like the Center for Arizona Policy with a $2.2 million budget, the Alliance Defending Freedom, $55 million budget. We are quite small with our three part-time staff, but we are mighty and we are making a difference. It's important for you to know when you donate your money to us that is going right to our legislative program or to our legal program, and we will do the best we can. It is a good, solid investment. We are so small. This picture is from our legislative day at the Capitol. This is a day where we bring secular supporters from all over the state to the Capitol to advocate for secular public policies and to put a face on the secular community. You can imagine there are some lawmakers who've never actually interfaced with an atheist, so it's important for you to come to the Capitol. So are you ready to learn about the legislature? 
I'm going to give you just a little bit of basics here just so you understand. We essentially have 60 lawmakers in the House and 30 senators in the Senate and majority rules. Anything passes on 50% plus one. This is why elections matter, because we have such a slim uh, majority here in the House of Representatives, 3129, and yet it's the majority's agenda that gets pushed through. How do they do that? Well, they pick the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House picks the chair, Chairman of the Committees. The Chairman of the Committees and the Speaker together decide who sits on those committees. And in order for anything to pass at the legislature, it needs to go through a committee. It needs to pass through a committee. And so this is how they do it. So they stack committees and they also only hear bills that they really want to hear. Um, so it is, it, it can be frustrating at times, but um, we've been doing a great job of developing relationships with some moderate Republicans who tend to agree with us some of the time. And also we have good relationships with the Democrats. And it hasn't always been that way. Over the years, I've had to um, build that relationship and make it not so scary to understand that secularism is government for everyone, and it's not anti-religion at all. We just want public policy free from religious bias. So this is why, again, elections matter. We need to make sure that we have more people in the state legislature who support secular public policy than who don't, so we can move forward on our goals. I'd love to tell you a little bit about this year and why this year is so special. We started as normal on the second Monday in January, which was January 13th. We had um, a bill deadline of February 10th. That's the last day lawmakers could introduce bills. On February 21st, the last day that bills could be heard in the committee of the House of Origin, meaning House bills in the House, Senate bills in the Senate. And at that point, we had what's called crossover week, which was when the bills go from the House to the Senate and the Senate to the House. In that week, we had Secular Day at the Capitol, a wonderful day, the best day of the year, in my opinion. Then everything changed on March 13th. March 13th is the day that the galleries closed, and this is because of COVID. It was right after the governor had declared a public emergency, a public health emergency. So you can imagine everything started to change and nobody really knew what was going on. The following Monday, the whole week was still scheduled for committee hearings and bills had been put on the agenda, but what happened was they cut it all off. They said no agendas, no committees, even the rules committee. So any bill that hadn't moved up to that point, was it, it's practically dead. There's still two weeks, there were still supposed to be two weeks left of committee hearings. So there were quite a few bills that, that didn't make it this year. Um, you'll see on the chart here too that April 13th is the day they were expecting to come back. Well, I'll tell you that we've heard um, two days ago, we heard from the Senate president and the Speaker of the House, they're not coming back on that date. We anticipate they'll come back in May. So session is not over, they're just adjourned. It's kind of on pause. So you'll see here too, April 25th is their statutory deadline to finish session. They're not going to be done by that time, and it's real easy for them just to continue that date. Let's talk about by the numbers. So by February, uh, by the deadline, it was 1,731 bills that had been introduced by the uh, state legislature. And right now, only 58 have made it to the finish line. That's an incredibly low number. Of these bills, though, we were watching 76 of them. We identified 76 bills of interest, including 49 that we supported, 20 we opposed, and seven that we were just kind of watching. They were interesting bills, and they quite possibly could have turned into something we needed to be involved in. But uh, as it turns out, I didn't need to get involved in any of those so far. As we supported, there were 49 total. Three bills were moving. Three. Only three. That's... Uh, a low number, right? But it's life. That's kind of the way it has been. In fact, three is more than I've ever really had before. Usually I maybe have one. So it was an interesting year. The other 46 bills are all considered dead bills. So let me tell you about the bills that we supported. First of all, House Bills 2051, um, informed consent, public examinations, I can't believe we needed a bill for this, but apparently we did. And what this bill says is that if a woman is unconscious, um, you can't do a public examination on her unless it's an emergency. You have to have her consent. Simple, right? Well, this bill had passed the House and it was moving on to the Senate. Um, I'm sorry, it, it moved on to the Senate, but it did not make it to an agenda before the COVID pause. And so this bill most likely is dead. 
because I don't really know if they're going to be doing committee hearings or not. We'll see. The next bill that we supported was on the Holocaust and giving instruction to students in schools about the Holocaust. This bill passed 59 to 0 in the House and it passed through the Senate Education Committee. It passed through Senate rules and it awaits a full vote on the Senate floor. This is a bill that when they come back is most likely going to be heard because it's not controversial and it's already moved through the process. The last bill that we were supporting was Senate Bill 1494 regarding pharmacists and hormonal contraceptives. This, this bill would basically, it's kind of like a middle ground between making birth control pills over the counter. Um, so basically the pharmacist would be able to dispense a birth control pill to a woman under the authority of the Department of Health Services. She would not need to go to her doctor for um, a renewal of that prescription every year. It's a fantastic bill, but it is caught up in politics. It passed the Senate unanimously, but plenty, with plenty of time to go through the House process, but the House was holding it up. There's some politics at play here, some interpersonal fights between the bill's sponsor and others. I could go into more detail, but not for this presentation. I'll save that for another day. You can buy me a drink. I'd like to talk to you about some of the bills that were moving that we had opposed. So there were 20 total bills that we opposed, but only three of them were moving um, when we went to COVID pause. So 13 of them were considered dead bills. One bill was signed into law and three bills were successfully killed by secular coalition. And what's the difference between a killed bill and a dead bill? Well, a dead bill is one that never moved and a killed bill is one that we actually saw on a committee agenda and we were able to successfully kill it. Like it, it didn't make it um, through the process, but it had already started through. So. I consider a dead bill to be one that never moved in the first place and a killed bill to be one that stopped after it started. I'm going to talk to you about all of them. Let's talk about bills we opposed. House Bill 2706 is the latest in a series of hate group backed Christian nationalist bills seeking to ban transgender athletes from participating on girls and women's school sports teams. The bill solves no documented problem and has no scientific basis. Transgender athletes have already participated in Arizona intramural teams for years without incident. Regulations already exist to vet transgender athletes for their sincerity in wishing to participate on a girls team. House Bill 2706 will hurt girls and women of all kinds. It would exacerbate the problem of female athletes being notoriously attacked for having masculine attributes. It exposes girls accused of being too masculine to ridicule, accusation, and privacy violations during their formative years. It's just a horrible bill. We know that Phoenix Mercury star Brittany Griner has experienced these things, and she's been accused of looking too masculine. Accusations against women of being men have historically resulted in humiliations, like insisting a player be checked for being a boy. Accusations under this bill could lead to bullying, unnecessary inspections of girls' anatomy, and a host of other invasive and traumatizing consequences. There have been instances of women and girls being harassed and assaulted due to the bathroom bills of the past, which similarly called into question women's gender. This bill may lead to exposing young girls to be intersex who have no idea they are intersex. The decision to label these girls as, quote, biological males is often more traumatizing and stigmatizing than it is accurate. This bill had four hours of debate on the floor. It prevents, it, sorry, it presents with student doctor privacy issues, impossible violation of HIPAA. So basically, if you are um, a girl playing on a sports team and someone from the other team thinks you look too masculine, they can file a complaint under this bill. And then you have to go to your doctor and have a DNA test and have those results returned back to the sports team before you can play, proving that you are who you say you are. Now let's talk about Senate Bill 1143, another bill opposed by the Secular Coalition. 
This bill is on anti-Semitism and includes an overly broad definition of anti-Semitism that could set precedent for political majority to punish speech with which those they do not agree. It defines anti-Semitism using the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition and the examples. Under this, one could not criticize Israel's blasphemy laws. We strongly oppose all hate crimes. However, a secular government is one that doesn't favor one religion over another. It's one which allows free speech and promotes critical thinking, promotes debate and discussion. Senate Bill 1143 would curb individuals' rights to free speech and to criticize governments or religions. Senate Bill 1143 would require DPS to collect information on crimes that are motivated by anti-Semitism in addition to current requirements that do the same thing. We already have statutes on the book that report on crimes based on religion. Those are hate crimes, including race, sexual orientation, gender, disability, religion. It's already there. Defining anti-Semitism in this way with this broad definition and using these examples would cause a chilling effect on free speech and First Amendment rights in the United States. It is for these reasons and others that we have opposed this bill. And we didn't oppose it at first. We didn't quite realize how um, the depth of the definition, because it's not actually listed in the bill. You have to research it and go a little farther and take some steps. We do not support or condone any violence or hatred against any group of people based on their religion or anything else. But we cannot support this bill because of the overly broad definition of anti-Semitism and again, the chilling effect it would have on free speech and First Amendment rights. I would like to share with you some sad news, which is that there is a bill that we opposed that was signed into law. Senate Bill 1224 regarding empowerment scholarship accounts on the Navajo reservation was signed into law. And what this bill does is it basically expands the program. It expands the program of the school vouchers, which is money, public dollars for private education. It expands it out to a Christian school that exists two miles across the Arizona border that's being utilized by several families on the Navajo Nation. Now this bill was um, opposed by the Indigenous Peoples Caucus and opposed by the Navajo Nation president, also opposed by the all three representatives, the two representatives and one senator from the Navajo Nation. Nobody wanted to take the education away from the students who were already receiving it. So the Democrats had come up with an idea to basically give these students the opportunity to continue using the, the funds to continue their education until they graduated. That was rejected. And instead, they've expanded the program to allow for all students in the future to use Arizona public tax dollars to attend a private Christian school in New Mexico. It is a very small expansion, but an expansion nonetheless. We opposed the bill, and again, there was a four-hour debate on this bill, but it was signed into law by Governor Ducey on the 20th of March. This was one of the very last bills to be debated on the House floor before they moved into the COVID. How about some good news for a change? I'd love to tell you about some bills that we helped to kill. Did you know that an overwhelming majority of Arizona households support comprehensive and medically accurate sex education? It's even bipartisan. There was a poll done in 2016 and another done earlier this year in January that shows that Republicans, more than half of Republicans, support medically and scientifically accurate sex education, 91% of Democrats. So Senator Sylvia Allen's proposal, Senate Bill 1082, is just out of touch. It would move Arizona in the opposite direction. It would instantly freeze out sex education in both district and charter schools because the bill contained a provision that allowed parents to sue if they felt that something was wrong. Um, it connected health education with crimes against children. It's full of fear. Senate Bill 1082 would just make it too difficult for any school district to provide a safe and healthy form of sex education. And we heard from many in the school community that they would just stop offering it altogether. Parents and guardians have the right 
to help shape sex education curriculum in their local schools. There is local control over this. They are already able to review all educational materials that are used in the children's classrooms. And they have the right to withdraw their children out of any instruction which conflicts with moral or religious beliefs. Parents have that right already. Nobody's taking that away from them. Current Arizona law protects families who prefer to teach these lessons at home. Arizona parents must provide written permission for their children to participate in sex education right now. So what's the problem? Why did we need Senate Bill 1082? The, the real goal of Senate Bill 1082 is to ban education for other people's children. For everyone who wants it, they wanted to stop it. Senate Bill 1082 put kids in danger because without medically accurate, age-appropriate information, children are at higher risk for sex abuse. They're at higher risk for coercive relationships and unwanted sexual activity. They're at greater risk for suicide, greater risk for bullying, and higher risk for contracting a sexually transmitted disease. Children would also be at higher risk for teen pregnancy without comprehensive, medically accurate sex education. I'm so glad we were able to kill this bill before session even started. So House Bill 2388 and Senate Bill 1323 are mirror bills that were running with the same exact language at the same time during um, session. One was in the House and the other was in the Senate. They both pass through committee. What does this bill do? Well, this is very similar to the bill that we saw at the end of session last year. This one appropriates $3 million of taxpayer dollars to a group that promotes um, childbirth and basically is anti-abortion. So what this group does, and it's called Human Coalition, and what they do, they're based out of Texas. They essentially use um, geo-targeting, geo-fencing, and they find women who are looking for information on pregnancy or abortion and then fill their phone with advertising and basically luring them in to what are called um, crisis pregnancy clinics. Now, crisis pregnancy clinic is something, um, it's a religious-based organization that pretends or maybe just appears on the outside to be a health clinic to provide um, ultrasounds or free pregnancy tests, they lure women in and then they convince them through lots of manipulation techniques not to have an abortion. This is all part of this anti-choice movement across the United States. So we're talking about $3 million, taxpayer dollars, to fund these religious organizations that do not give any of information to women about any of their full broad range of options. They are not full clinics. So this bill is terrible because it's an invasion of women's privacy, among other things. And at the end of the day, we were able, with a coalition of many groups, health care groups, um, community groups, our group as well, in opposing this bill. So even though the bills passed through committee, they did not make it to the floor before the COVID pause. These are considered highly controversial bills. We believe they don't have the votes to pass it in the Senate. And so these bills are most likely dead and we have essentially killed them because they did start moving and we were able to stop them. Aside from legislation, the Secular Coalition for Arizona also works on invocations. The United States Supreme Court back in 2014 decided that invocations in government meetings are considered historical and they're just traditions, so they're allowed to happen. But they did say that everybody needs to have an opportunity to give the invocation, regardless of their religious beliefs or not. And so what we see at the state legislature is that there is just a continuing issue of invocations at, the, at our capital. They are mostly religious, but we at the Secular Coalition for Arizona, since we cannot stop invocations before government meetings, we have decided to start working on bringing secular invocations, which are inclusive which are inviting and warm and welcoming for everybody in the room, including the school children sitting in the gallery. These secular invocations, we've had great success. Every year we have done more and more and more, and they have becoming a normal thing at the legislature, which I think is fantastic. It's gotten to the point now where lawmakers just do them. 
and they don't even ask me for help. It used to be that I would have to help them and ask them constantly, hey, would you do, would you do? Now they realize that, that secular invocations are the best way to ensure secular government for all of their constituents, not just those of a particular religious base. So if I were to tell you that in 2019, we had 21 secular invocations at the state legislature, how many would you guess we had in 2020 before the COVID pause? I'll let you think about that for just a second. 16 is the answer. So we have been normalizing secular invocations at the Arizona State Capitol since 2013 when we first um, helped Senator, who was then a representative, Juan Mendez, to give the very first secular invocation by an atheist at a state legislature in the entire country. It made national news. And ever since then, we have been working steadily to normalize a secular invocation. So invocations at the state capitol have historically been very religious. And when Senator Mendez first did his back in 2013, he got hit with a lot of pushback. And ever since then, there have been second prayers given. There have been heated debates that have lasted for 45 minutes about whether or not the atheist just gave a prayer or not. So you heard earlier what a secular invocation is like. They're all very similar to that, very respectful, very inclusive of everybody, and yet there is still trouble. So this year on our secular day at the Capitol, Senator Mendez wanted to give a secular invocation. The very first week of session, all the way back in January, he did ask for that date and the Senate President's office didn't give it to him. In fact, they never said no, they just, wouldn't really respond. They're like, we're working on it, we're working on it. Well, a week before Secular Day at the Capitol, on February 18th, we heard that he had been given the date for the prayer, which is fantastic. We had actually put in a public records request the few days leading up to that to find out what was going on. So that may or may not have had something to do with it. But regardless, he was told he was going to have the prayer and all of the secular supporters who came to the Capitol that day were eager to hear him pray. Only when it came time for him to do so, the Senate president had changed her mind or forgotten or she was reading wrong. I don't know exactly what happened on her end, but she gave the prayer to someone else who gave a two minute religious prayer. And here it was secular day at the Capitol. Now, Senate president apologized, but um, I have to say it's a pretty weak apology because we have asked her for a meeting and she hasn't even responded to us. We wanted the chance to sit down with her if she was truly sorry to explain to her why this was such a big deal to us and why it hurts the secular community. To this date, she has not responded to our request for a meeting. So we will continue to work on that and we'll keep moving forward with invocations the best we can. And hopefully the day will come when either we have no invocations or an atheist can give an invocation in peace with nobody giving him or her trouble. So what's happened since March 20th? Um, last week, we know that there were five states that implemented abortion, um, abortion rules as far as calling them non-essential. Arizona is not one of those, and so far, we don't think that it will be. Governor Ducey did move $2 million from DES into funding the state's 211 help hotline, which is a place where Arizonans can go to find social services and food boxes, utility, rent assistance, the things that they need. We fully support funding 211. However, he put a gag rule on it and said that that money cannot be used to refer anyone to an abortion or even um, any place that refers to abortion. So that is widely disappointing. We will work on that in the next session. I promise you we will. For now, the state needs the money. So um, everyone needs to know how to get the help. Additionally, the governor issued a stay home order that included an exclusion for religious activities and also free speech. He he did that in the same in the same sentence. So um, thankfully, many churches have already moved to online worship, but some are not. And his order does put public health at risk by exempting religious worship. So we are working on an action alert to get letters into the governor to ask him to remove that exemption. He also posted this on Palm Sunday just a few days ago, and as you can see, there is quite a bit of religious overtone to this. He 
does post things. He is personally Catholic, but this is not his personal page. This is his official government page, and this kind of stuff does not belong on there. He only posts for Catholic and Jewish holidays. That's it. Every other religion in the state gets left out by our governor. This is why it's important to ensure we have a secular government, because a secular government is a government for all. I would like to invite you to sign up for action alerts from us, secularaz.org. Just put in your email address and you'll never miss a beat. We'll let you know what's going on. And that's it for the presentation today. I hope you've enjoyed it. My email address is on the screen. I'm happy to answer your questions and there will be another update coming because we will have more session. We are not done. I just wanted to let you know where we are at. Thank you for your support, and I hope that you are all doing well. Thank you so much. Just one final thank you and an opportunity for you to get my email address. Hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Mwah. Hope to see you soon in person. Bye.